Hello and welcome to another episode of The Open Road, a podcast in which we discuss aspects of open source culture. My name is Rich Bowen and I'm a community architect in the open source program office at Red Hat. My name is Brian Proffitt and I also work in the open source program office at Red Hat as a manager of all things. Who knew? So, and welcome our- to another edition. So. Hi, Rich. Hi. In our previous episode, we talked about citizenship, membership in open source communities. And when you when your community grows to more than two people, you need to figure out who's in charge. And so in this episode, we're going to be talking about how leadership is selected. Yeah, that's right. And and you know, we live in a world where democracy is fairly well established as a a pretty solid form of governance. Some could argue that it works sometimes better than others, but we'll not get into that today. Um, But for open source projects, the the range of governance is actually much more broad um, in terms of things that work and work well. Um, So you have instances where a meritocracy is involved. You have benevolent dictators for life. Um, And then you have, you know, fully, you know, full on, very rigorous, democratized voting systems in place. Um, So we we talked to, again, a bunch of different people. Um, First up is our colleague at Red Hat, Dave Neary, who is a senior principal software engineer who also works in the open source program office. And we put the question to him, how do leaders get selected? I don't know about optimal, but I can tell you how it usually happens, uh, which is incumbency. Uh, Project founders and early members have, by nature of their early position in the project, much more seniority in general. Uh, Is that the way it should be? Um, It's certainly difficult to argue that it's ideal, given the gender makeup and racial makeup of most uh, leadership in open source projects. Um, but it's really difficult to come up with, once that system is in place, it's really difficult to come up with an alternative system that will replace it. Um, you need to, as a, as a project, really actively cultivate new leaders, um, new maintainers, as you continue to grow the project, because some of your old people will leave. So, and how do you do that? How do you do that succession planning? Well, I... Don't know if you've spoken to Josh Barkas yet, but I really liked uh, some of the things that the Kubernetes community has put in place where they identify key control points, um, key positions where there's only one person or maybe even nobody uh, who's who's doing the job. And they identify people who have an interest in that area and who are prepared to essentially work as an apprentice under the person who's doing the job. Uh, so for, for example, for release management, um, you might spend one release cycle shadowing the release manager. The next release cycle, you will be hands on the keyboard doing the release cycle with the release manager shadowing you. And then the third release, you actually do it on your own. And now you have two release managers. Um, And I really like that idea of consciously identifying both roles, the people who are in those roles and people who could potentially fill in for those roles and having a, a conscious training cycle for them. I really like it. I haven't seen a better solution in other projects is, is basically what I'm getting at. Okay. Is it is it fair then to say that like if you have even like democratized systems like voting in place that the incumbency factor still weighs fairly heavily on that? Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think uh, any any projects and certainly you know looking at uh, Rich and the the feather behind behind his back, any project from Apache to Debian to Gnome or KDE that has an election process for choosing their leaders, um, you'll see the same names year on year. And they tend to be the people who are the, who have been around the longest and who are the most respected and who have shown themselves through the history of the project to have the skills required to be a leader, which obviously favors um, incumbency over, over newcomers. 
also you know a lot of people who vote in community projects like uh for example i remember this being an issue with openstack um a lot of people who vote in community projects vote primarily on name recognition because mm -hmm. maybe they're not you know as as i was saying earlier you've got a gradient of participation and most of the people in a project might not know the names of a lot of the candidates other than the people who have who have been the public figures and recognized leaders of the project for a long time. So Dave had some interesting ideas there that uh, were not the answers that I expected to hear. So this was this was uh, it was it was kind of uh, you know Dave always has thought things through quite a bit before he opens his mouth, and and I appreciate that about him. So uh, two things that struck me: one was regarding. Um, actively looking for apprentices to take a role. And I've seen this done really well in one particular place, and that was the treasurer role at the Apache Software Foundation, where um, the, 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 the treasurer at the time actively went looking for people that were willing to apprentice and, you know, brought, brought those people up and, uh, and, and had those those uh, the the difficult situations handled by the person with seniority, while the junior person started to learn the ropes. Um, but the other side of that that I've noticed, and here I am telling on myself, when you're the person with seniority in a particular position, it's very hard to step back. It's very hard to let go of those reins, and allow someone else to fail or even worse allow someone else to succeed in ways that i wouldn't have done it myself and uh, i've experienced that myself in a number of roles where it's hard for me to let go of something that i think i'm good at and allow somebody else to excel at it yeah exactly i mean it it's a natural instinct to want to fix something and if you yeah. feel like you're the experienced person in the in the group, it's like, get out of my way. I'm going to fix this. Um, you know, because you know the 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 it's like what we I do with parenting when the kids were little. You know, it was like you know it's faster for me to just do it than explain it to you. Now, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, I realize that that's probably not the best approach. Perhaps I added to some therapy for my children, <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's a trap we all fall into, and you know, we get intellectually a little bit lazy about it. We just we're just like whatever, go and do it. Um, yeah, and the, the 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 other thing that he he brought up just just the whole you're absolutely right. He's Dave's always well spoken. Um, you know, the idea of incumbency. Um, in my, you know, my Midwestern Hoosier background, I would just assign that like friction or inertia or something like that. But incumbency is absolutely the best word. And we see this all the time yeah. Yeah. in open source communities because it feels like just a natural thing. Somebody's been here longer, they should be in charge, you know, or they've been in charge all this time everything seems fine um why change it yeah a counter example to this that i'm involved in right now is we're right now we're we're electing for two new board members for the centos projects two directors stepped down who had been with the project from the very beginning and we asked the community to nominate people that they thought would be good people on the board and you know this may be an outgrowth of some of the dissatisfaction of the community and in, in how things have gone in the last couple of years, but we had almost everyone that was nominated were completely new to the community, and and this this has been really fascinating because these people were nominated specifically to bring new ideas to the project, and you don't see that very often. So this has been really encouraging to me as a community manager to see this happen. Yeah. Yeah. I just getting new people in um, is, is going to be a benefit. I really do believe that. The, I have not personally witnessed the shadowing uh, concept that Dave was talking about, at least in a community situation. I've seen it a few times in professional situations mm -hmm. 
you know, being a journalist, there's a there's a little bit of a, 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 a uh, excuse me, there's a little bit of an apprentice model um, that goes along with some you know older uh, yeah, publishing houses, but you know that's the extent of it. But it made a lot of sense to me, and it would be interesting yeah. to see more uh, projects thoughtfully uh, do that kind of shadowing. Uh, but certainly it's an ancient concept and mm -hmm. there there's a lot of things that we do in open source where we don't think we have a lot to learn from the past and we want to invent things from scratch. And so it's kind of cool to see this starting to be injected into, you know, major successful projects like Kubernetes. Exactly. And, and Kuber, projects like Kubernetes, and I'm not... I'm not really holding one project above another in terms of that, but Kubernetes is one of those that grew very quickly um, and the importance of it and the amount of resources, both financial and human resources that were put into that project just, you know, exploded. Um, and it happens occasionally. Um, and, and, I'm glad that they have the time and the people in Kubernetes that I know are thoughtful enough to sort of step back and take care of things. Because there are other projects, and I'm not naming names, but there have been other projects that have also seen a similar explosive growth, and they've almost collapsed under their own weight, um, which is unfortunate. Um, and and I don't wish that on any project. So I think I think the shadowing and the thoughtful care of who your leaders are gonna be, I think that's a great way to do it. So the next person we're gonna to go to is Greg Crow Hartman, and he is part of the Linux kernel project. And if you watched our previous episode, you already know what he's gonna say, but uh, <laughs> here's what he had to say. We have Im implicit leadership, not explicit leadership. I guess okay. in a way. I mean, we all implicitly trust that Linus's version on, on this specific Git branch on this specific website is the one that we all sync off of, right? That's work and that's how it works. And um, that's the only leadership we have there. So we have leadership in when you own and maintain portions of your project, people look to you to review it and go on that. But the nice thing is, and I graphed this years ago, any of us can be routed around. And anybody, I mean, we're at a distributed model. Um, we don't make the rule, and a lot of other projects have this problem. I you know I've talked to the BSDs in the past where you can't keep somebody from touching your code, right? A lot of people have these things saying, oh, no, don't touch this code over there. I'm going to go work on it later. So they disappear. They don't do that. We don't have that rule. It's first one to modify something or send in a change wins per se, but as long as you play along and work with everybody else. The way our leadership resolves conflicts is if you have two competing groups trying to do something in the same area, we make them agree before we'll take anything. So we don't have to, we make them, because they're going to have to own it and work with it. Very, very, very rarely do we ever have to make a decision to say we're picking you <laughs> over you. And those are every couple years at most. Um, you don't really want to do that because then you just burn you just burn that other developer group that those people are never going to work with you anymore and you're not going to want to have to mess with that. Um, the ideal goal should be for people contributing to a project is to make it so their use case works, not necessarily that the code is accepted if they submit, right? So if you have competing ideas, the best idea that solves the use case for everybody should win. And that's our that's our goal as far as that goes. That, I think that kind of diverged from the original question. No, no that's totally fine. So I, one of the things that I'm very concerned about in project leadership is succession planning. And uh, one of the things that, that you said, and, and I've seen this discussed in the Linux community for, for many years, but uh, one of the things that you said is that you trust Linus to, to accept what is good and right and <laughs> and uh, to lead the project in that way. What is your succession planning for the, the day when he decides he no longer wishes to do that? Well, we all agree that his is a tree we sink off of, right? And that we send changes to. So anybody can work off their own. I mean, everybody forks the Linux kernel because you have to 
and then you work on your changes and you submit them upstream. That's his is the tree that we we all agree on, and it's a matter of trust. Like not necessarily you don't trust these people are going to that they got the code right, but they'll be there to fix it later when it gets it wrong because we all, always get it wrong. Um, yes, we do have we've talked about successions and the kernel, and we have people doing that. Um, if you remember, Lena stepped down for a little while okay. a number of years ago. And, I was able to write to the tree and there's a, we have a number of people that are able to write to his specific repo. If we want to sync off of that, um, the way Git works, anybody can, uh, we can say, oh, it's going to be so-and-so tomorrow. We all agree that, that that sounds like the best idea and we sync off of his tree. So, I mean, it doesn't really need to work specifically that way. That being said, privately, we have talked about this. We do know what we're going to do. So that's not a big deal right now. None of us have any history or any, um, inclination to stop doing this work for a while. So I believe it's included. So the inevitable, what if Glenis gets hit by a bus? <laughs> Which I, is not funny, but it is kind of funny because I remember this conversation happening as early as like, like the early 2000s, yeah. if not before, because people really quickly began to see how important Linux was for their operations. And they then realized that at the time there was, you know, one guy in charge and there's still really one guy in charge, but they didn't understand it. You know, they thought it was just him. I've literally had conversations in the early 2000s with people thinking, oh, is this just one guy in, in, in Finland or Sweden or wherever he is? And it's like, <laughs> uh, it's a few more than that. You know, <laughs> but all that's so, interesting is that if if your entire source of wisdom is the the press and an outsider's view, you might still believe that that uh, Linux is a is a benevolent dictator for life model, mm -hmm. and it it's not that. And um, you know, it's always encouraging to hear folks like Greg explain how things actually work in the real world. Right, right. Yeah, because it, 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 it isn't. You know, we, we tease it, we uh, get around all about it, but and, and Linus obviously has a lot of sway and pull, but it is he is by no means a natural dictator and things like that. Due to the incumbency again, factor that we talked about a moment ago. Right, I mean, this is incumbency writ large, but it, it's working. This is the model that everybody's agreed to, and they're just, you know, going along with it. And I'm not saying that in any kind of apathetic way. I mean, this sure. is the, the social contract that they signed up for, and they are just, it's just rocking and rolling, and here we are today, and Linux is taking over the world. Um, and, yeah, and as we alluded to when we introduced Greg, you know, he they're basically just like, okay, whatever, we just all agree to do this thing and that's the way it all works. And that's cool. Why and <laughs> echoing it? back to our previous episode and our previous uh, mm -hmm. clip of, of our conversation with him, it is once again, the model of the people that, that want to get in there and do the work mm -hmm. are the people that, that lead the show. And so, membership and leadership are selected in much the same way they're the people that are getting stuff done exactly and i and and, and going back again to the the deep history of the linux kernel you know i remember when the, it was news breaking when different maintainers were chosen um you know for different branches mm -hmm. or different modules or what have you i remember when when Greg um, was elevated to maintainer status for the first time in the Linux kernel. And, you know, those were newsworthy events because people were like, oh, okay, he's building, he's building some kind of governance. Or, yeah. And yes, but he's also basically just trying to delegate work and get stuff done. That you said it yourself. It is about in the Linux kernel getting stuff done. So our third interview is once again with Jack Abutbul, who is the community manager for the fairly young Alma Linux project. And I say fairly young because that sort of sets the stage here. Um, 
this this project is new. It doesn't have the the extensive history and maturity of some other projects, and so they're still in the setup stage. And you know, let that let that frame your your listening as we go into this clip of our questions with him. Yes. Yeah, so we actually didn't have our first election yet because we're still. Um, you know, uh, uh, putting together the membership body, I think today we're like close to like 110 um, members so far. Um, and so once we hit that critical mass, we will have elections. But, you know, I, I think the leadership of a project, it, it's it's twofold. I think it's it's a little bit meritocracy based on the work that you do. But I think uh, the other side of it is uh, the willingness to listen to people. And so I think that people uh, in the community should be able to vote on who they feel uh, accomplishes those goals for them. You know, so I mean, it's it's you see many projects that have great technical leaders, but uh, they kind of you know my way or the highway, or not, they're they're just not receptive to it being anything other than their vision for whatever reason uh, uh, they pick. But uh, I think that, you know, you, for me at least, I find it a lot better when um, the maintainers and the leaders of the project are also responsive to people. And so I think that uh, that should be a big part of it. And that's why we decided that, you know, yes, we do think people should vote on who they feel best represents them, uh, just like you do in any other kind of representative government. And, uh, you know, let, let people uh, make their case for why they should be where they want to be and let, uh, let the members vote on it. So, Jack, um, I kind of like his approach. And he, you know, spoilers, he's sort of uh, going to lead into the next question that's coming up in this series about are leaders supposed to be proactive versus reactive? Clearly, he's setting up um the stage for in their case they are, are certainly going to be you know reactive and listening i it was interesting that he directly specified meritocracy which is a common theme with you know open source project leaders but then he also threw in but they need to be well, able to listen and mm -hmm. that was that was really interesting to me and i'm you know, I find myself hoping that they can pull that off um, and, and not to disparage developers or any way like that. But that's not, you know, that balancing act is hard. It is. Um, yeah. And I, it's also, you know, some of the context here is that, that Jack is talking about a governance board, a board of directors for a foundation. And this is subtly different from what Greg's talking about, which is more technical leadership. And this is something that we touch on in, in one of our later episodes in this particular subseries. But uh, that is going to give a different flavor to whether you're trying to select a representative governance system or whether you want people to be the ones getting the work done. But uh, I, I, do, I do think it's important to give the community a voice in how decisions are made and in what decisions are made. And that's that's the model that they're working with here. Yeah, and and and, the, and a foundation that can do that well is is good. We've obviously we've touched on foundations in earlier episodes of the open road. Um but yeah, the how how they will maintain that balance um will be interesting to me because um they really, you know, as, as we talked about in the last episode, you know, all Linux is doing things in a very specific way because of what they perceived happened in earlier projects. And we'll leave it at that. Um, and, and, you know, right or wrong, and I don't really think they're wrong, but, you know, they're, they're going in and they're saying, this is a new direction for us. So um, it's exciting uh, for me to see this kind of thing happening because we are actually watching a project being born in a deliberative manner, as opposed to a bunch of you know developers getting together, um, making something that turns out to be popular and suddenly they got to figure out how to run the thing. 
Um, and this I think is really cool. I think we see that more now than we did in the early mm -hmm. days of open source. And, and we touched on this a moment ago with, with regard to Kubernetes. Kubernetes was founded um, with very much in mind some past failures of other projects. Alma Linux is doing the same thing. It didn't just grow organically. It's people sitting down um, intentionally, deliberately saying, how can we avoid the mistakes of the past? And mm -hmm. how can we build a better thing that better represents users, better represents the market, better represents our developers, and, and it feels much more intentional than um, 20 years ago when it was, we've kind of figured stuff out as we went along. Yeah, and, and there's still a lot of work to be done here as far as like education and guidance around governance um, because you know, I just today I had a conversation with some people at Red Hat about a new project that they're doing and what do we have to do to get it open, you know, open to the world. It's been open source, but you know, they want to kick it out and get more people involved. And it's like, great, and go down the list. And one of them, you know, is governance. You know, and they're like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, you know, the very simple, I have a pretty simple definition. It's basically like, if there's a problem, who fixes it? Yeah. You know, if there's a technical discussion, you know, disagreement, who settles the argument? If there's a social problem, you know, who, you know, who calls that? It mediates. You know? yeah. Exactly. So, you know, on that level, it's fairly simple. Obviously, there's more to it than that when you get a lot of corporations involved. But, you know, that's. It, it's nice because, you know, and it's not just Red Hat. I don't want to, you know, there's, it's it's Microsoft, it's GitHub, it's VMware, it's, you know, the Apache Foundation, the Linux Foundation, all these different groups, the to-do group, um, you know, I could go on and on and I probably will, but all these different available resources are here now, which we didn't see in the early days of open source. And, and that's really... That's encouraging to me because, yeah, probably some people make some mistakes here and there, but for the most part, there's so much to reach out and grab and, and model themselves after. And there's so many new mistakes we can make now. Yes, <laughs> like podcasts. Those are fun. No. <laughs> so once so. again, a big thank you to our guests, and mm -hmm. we do have more comments from them in future episodes. So please do continue to follow this conversation. Thank you very much. So until the next time on the next edition of The Open Road, my name is Brian Proffitt. And I'm Rich Bowen. We wish and you thank well. Thank you for listening. Be safe.